Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Cadith Lecture Series. I'm Karen Lee, Director of Health Economics at Cadith, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session and introducing our guest speaker. I'd like to start by acknowledging that today's talk is being presented on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Today's lecture will take about 45 minutes, after which we'll open things up for discussion and questions from our in-person and online participants. Cadith lectures are social media friendly events, so you're encouraged to tweet using the hashtag Cadith Talks. More than, 40, uh, more than 450 people have registered for today's lecture, including people here with me today in Ottawa, and online participants from across Canada, as well as the United States, the United Kingdom, Taiwan, Lebanon, India, and Australia. The international interest in today's lecture is not surprising, the opioid crisis is a global problem. According to an article by Louisa Genhard, um, published in The Lancet last year, the Global Burden of Disease, Injuries, and Risk Factors study estimated that in 2017, over 40 million people were dependent on opioids, and over 109,000 people died from opioid, uh, an opioid overdose. Here in Canada, the opioid crisis continues to devastate families and communities. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada, an estimated 12,800 Canadians died from an apparent opioid-related overdose between January 2016 and March 2019. Opioid addiction is a complex issue that requires a compassionate, multifaceted, and evidence-based response. One of those facets is health economics, the branch of economics concerned with how to best allocate scarce healthcare resources for maximum benefit. In this lecture, the role and impact of health economics in supporting decision making will be explored using the case study of cost effectiveness of naloxone kits in the Canadian high schools and community centers. Uh, and community centers. Naloxone is a medication called an opioid antagonist used to counter the effects of opioid overdose. Our guest lecturer today is Dr. Lauren Cipriano an outstanding young health economist based at Western University in London, Ontario, where she is an associate professor at Ivy Business School in the department and in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. With her responsibilities as a professor and mentor, not only to mention a research agenda that has resulted in a publication history that is truly impressive, both in a number and influence, both in numbers and influence, you'd think that she'd be too busy to take anything on. And you'd be wrong. She somehow manages to contribute to project work at Cadith. She sits as a member of our new Health Economics Advisory Council, and she delivers the occasional lecture. Lauren is passionate about healthcare in Canada and wants her research to have a positive impact on access to and the quality of healthcare. That commitment is evident by the topics she chooses, including screening and treatment policies for hepatitis C, stroke prevention, antimicrobial resistance, and the subject of today's lecture, health economic issues related to opioid addiction. Lauren received well-deserved recognition last year as a rising star in health technology assessment and was presented the Dr. Maurice McGregor Award in 2019 at the Cadiz Symposium. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Dr. Lauren Cipriano. So thank you very much for having me. The Dr. Maurice McGregor Award was a lovely honor uh, last year at the symposium, and it's always a pleasure to uh, join Cadeth here in Ottawa um, for many of our common projects. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a project we did um, uh, two years ago and last year, uh, looking at the cost effectiveness of naloxone in high schools. Um, but I'll start with my disclosure. So I am an employee of Western University, but I do not speak for them. Um, I have an NSERC grant. I definitely don't speak for them. And I do project work here at Cadeth, and I don't, don't speak for you. Um, and uh, over the past five years, I've also done some work for the US Institute for Clinical uh, Economic Review, similar to my work here at Cadeth, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare improvement in the World Health Organization looking at hepatitis C guidelines. I don't speak for any of them, just for myself today. So 
uh, two years ago in February, um, so basically right around this time, my colleague Greg Zarek and I saw this article in on the CBC News announcing that the Toronto school boards were going to start stocking schools with naloxone um, in order to respond to the opioid crisis. Um, and they said, we, th we haven't had a situation where a naloxone kit was needed in a school, so this was purely preventive and not reactive to anything. Um, and they estimated that it was going to cost them between sixteen dollars and $20,000 to prepare their staff and purchase the naloxone for um, their 116 uh, high schools in the Toronto District Board. And they compared this to pre being prepared for, with EpiPens for people who have peanut allergies. But in fact, Peanut allergies are about 2 to 4% of the population. Bee stings is 1 to 3% of the population. And 2 to 4% of the population in high schools doesn't need a naloxone kit. And so while this is sort of like putting EpiPens in high schools to prepare for uh, anaphylactic reactions, the risk is quite a bit lower. And so we thought to ourselves, is this cost effective? Is this sixteen dollars to $20,000, which isn't a large amount of money compared to the Toronto District School Board budget, for education, so this isn't a large sum of money, but just because it's inexpensive doesn't mean it's a good use of money, because that 20000 is coming from somewhere else that our schools could be doing something. But they were motivated by the current opioid crisis, um, which is a substantial one in Canada. Um, and so what we've seen between 20, uh, 2005 and 2011 was a, a str like strong increase in heavy duty opioids. And so um, in those cases, we're talking about things like Oxycontin and Percocets, um, in contrast to weak opioids like uh, codeine, for example. And so then we saw this circ turnaround with policy changes in the late 2009-2010 era. We start to see a, a decrease in strong opioids, but a very stark decrease in weak opioids. So while the number of prescriptions is staying constant, around 20 million prescriptions a year, we're seeing a, a pretty significant decrease in uh, prescriptions for codeine. And um, we're not yet down to the 2005 numbers for strong opioid prescriptions. And so when we look at the number of people in the population that are using a prescription opioid in Canada, it's gone down um, since 2009. Um, and so because largely due to this reduction in the use of weak opioids, um, but also strong opioids. But we're seeing this sort of plateau in sort of medical use. Non-medical use has always been fairly low. Um, but maybe our definition of what's medical use and non-medical use is changing as we're thinking about the indications for opioids um, being uh, tied back to the evidence base where we think that opioids are actually an appropriate indication. And then the proportion of the population that actually has opioid use disorder and, and has problematic use that's affecting their life is actually a very small number of people or a small fraction of people, but still an, a large absolute number of people affected in our society but not as large as the total number of people consuming opioids. When we think about the population in high schools, then um, the fraction of medical use in high schools is lower than the average medical use in the general population. Um, and so I've got two different sources here, which I think could be causing the, the sharp decrease. Um, but I was trying to string together um, some sources to get a comparison. Generally, it's lower than in the adult population, which is consistent with opioids being used for chronic pain, which is rare in high school aged individuals. But their non-medical use is actually quite a bit higher according to the surveys of um, high school age, uh, grades 7 to 12 in drug use, which we do um, study annually here in Ontario. So their non-medical use rates are pretty high when asked, have you used an opioid to get high in the past year? But when asked the question, have you used it more than six times, the numbers go down quite a bit. And so having used opioids once or twice um, in a non-medical fashion doesn't necessarily indicate a uh, sort of really frequent use. But this is still a problem and a problem that our high schools are, are struggling with and our society is struggling with. And so one possible response would be to put naloxone in schools. The opioid use both medical and non-medical and misuse can result in a large number of hospitalizations and that we've most certainly seen. So um, 
in uh, one more fact about high school use is that compared to when I was in high school, and I don't want to speak for any of you, the use of opioids has actually gone down quite a bit So um, for high school. So we saw this trend downward here in from uh, about 20% of people saying they tried it at least once to now down to 10%. Um, and that ha same thing has happened for sort of the strongest opioids we think of as non-medical use drugs. So heroin use in 1999, which was close to when I graduated in high school, was about 2% of people had tried heroin in high school. That's now down um, well below 1%. And it's about 0.9% of people say they tried fentanyl um, in high school deliberately, not as a contaminant in something else. That's about 5,800 high school students. So while the numbers are in absolute terms um, small compared to the population of Ontario, 5,800 teenagers using fentanyl um, on purpose in a year is something that's certainly concerning. And it's resulting in a lot of hospitalizations. And so what we've seen over the last decade is about a 53% increase in hospitalizations related to opioids and more than 100% when it comes to young people. In Ontario, we've seen a doubling. In Alberta, they've seen a quadrupling of the number of opioid-related hospitalizations. And these numbers are familiar to almost all of us because we see them reported in the news regularly. The total number of deaths related to opioids has gone from 3,000 in 2016, when we already knew we had a crisis, um, to 4,600 last year. And I just projected out, um, because we are expecting probably later this month what the 2019 numbers will be. Um, but we're looking at 4,800, maybe 5,000 opioid-related deaths in Canada this uh, past year. Um, and about 100 of them under the age of 19. This is not where the body of the opioid crisis is, but it's still significant. And the story relates to fentanyl. So over this time period, we've seen an increase in the proportion of deaths uh, involving fentanyl. And right now in Toronto, it's about 90% of opioid overdoses are related to fentanyl. So the fentanyl story is that uh, fentanyl entered the market in 2012 uh, as a diversion when OxyContin became difficult to purchase and expensive. That was a policy decision that brought fentanyl to the front of the table. Um, the number of seized illicit samples and testing positive has been increasing about 2 to 3% annually, and it's extremely low cost. That's why it's cheap to put into other counterfeit things. This is what you can uh, use if you're trying to um, provide an illicit counterfeit drug. And it used to be a contaminant and is now increasingly becoming a drug of choice, which certainly affects our policy decisions and considerations. So it is in this context that high schools were making this decision. And high school students are affected. And so we've got lots of local stories. So this uh, high school athlete, Zion, uh, bought contaminated Xanax, or what he thought was Xanax. Um, high school students um, in Etobicoke who thought they were buying ecstasy. Um, I don't know what this gentleman's daughter was uh, trying to buy. It probably wasn't fentanyl. Um, and in BC, cases of people trying to buy ecstasy um, and actually buying fentanyl. There have been local stories that you might have been affected by and highly publicized stories of individuals who started with medical prescriptions after surgery and found themselves using street drugs before they were out of high school. There are stories of opioid overdose in high school, but they're really rare inside high school buildings. So high school aged people being affected, that's happening with 100 deaths a year. But inside school buildings between 8 to 4, in classrooms and bathrooms and gyms and on campus grounds, is unusual. But you can see stories in the news of these are two American high schools. But you also should identify the naivety of the users. So this quote is, there were a lot of rumors people had overdosed on synthetic meth, synthetic heroin. As far as I know, probably OxyContin, because that's what seems to be the most thing teenagers can get their hands on as far as synthetic meth goes. This shows a lot of naivety about what they're actually consuming, because there is no synthetic meth. That's just all meth. Um, and synthetic meth and OxyContin are not the same thing. Um, and so the, the high school consumer may also be pretty naive. And that's consistent with the fact that 55 to 75% of high schoolers are getting the pills they're taking as drugs to misuse from their home cabinets and the cabinets of their family members and their friends. So they're not out on the streets buying. They're out in our cabinets pilfering what is available. And so it is in these 
uh, in this context that many uh, school districts have been considering this decision. And I understand here in Ottawa, there is naloxone in the high schools here. And some school districts are, are putting them in and some are deciding not to. Limestone District um, in November 2017 put naloxone in their schools and, um, and about a year later, Napanee High School, which is inside Limestone, near, it's in Kingston, um, had three overdoses in a very short time period, one of which it seemed like from the article occurred in the school. So this question of can we make naloxone more available to avoid these situations um, has been an ongoing public health trend and we're seeing naloxone availability become more widespread in our communities and in general here in Ontario if you go to a pharmacy you can get naloxone um, if you see that uh, you believe you know somebody who's at risk and you may be um, in need of it. So what is going to be the effectiveness of a naloxone distribution program in a high school setting? So there isn't a lot of literature on this. Um, uh, one year after implementation in an Ohio police service, they saw a 15% relative reduction in mortality. Massachusetts um, had a natural experiment where they had some low adoption communities and high adoption communities when they put naloxone in the hands of high risk individuals. And they ha saw a 27% reduction in mortality um, in the low adoption communities and almost a 50% reduction in the high adoption communities. But this is putting naloxone in the hands of people who are most likely to use it and to know that the person they're with has used an opioid. And witness bystanders, uh, report when they report using naloxone, they say it did what they expected it to do about 95% of the time. So it's not clear how good high school teachers and staff are going to be in an effectiveness setting because in the places we've seen it be the most effective, we know that the person with the individual overdosing knows what they've taken and knows the circumstances that they're in. Um, in the case with the police, you've got a more realistic first responder situation where you have some uncertainty about why the person might be unconscious or why their respiration rate might be very low um, and some training into the other signs and symptoms about pupil dilation and things like this and also some training about the cognitive biases about who might be an opioid user and who is not. And so police might be in fact better than teachers and staff who wouldn't necessarily have this training. Um, and so we might think we're gonna be on the low end, not the high end of, of being able to reduce mortality with naloxone in the hands of teachers and staff. There have been four, at the time that we did this, there have been four um, cost effectiveness analyses um, using models, uh, two US models, one UK model, and a Russian model, looking at the cost effectiveness of naloxone distribution to high risk individuals. Um, and so they focused on groups of people who had an annual risk of overdose of between seven and 20%. Uh, they found that it reduced opioid mortality by six to 13% in absolute numbers. So that's more than a 50% reduction in mortality. Um, and they found an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $2,000 per quality gained, and that's cost effective everywhere. And so this would be high value, um, and it's very likely high value in Canada in a similar way. But high schoolers don't have a 7 uh, to 20% annual risk of opioid overdose. And so we wanted to know under what conditions could school-based naloxone be cost effective? So we need to account for all the costs and then what was going to be our incremental effectiveness. We're going to have some setup costs and they told us they were going to cost them about $8,000 to put naloxone in 114 schools. They need to train the staff. We assume to train the trainer model, which is what a lot of um, communities are doing for naloxone. So we assumed that one teacher from each school would go and be trained by a public health nurse, and then they would go back to their school and train a few more staff and teachers. And so we've got to pay because that's an opportunity cost. If we were going to put teachers into some training for three or four hours um, or one hour, then they could be training for something else. They could be grading something. They could be working with students. So there's always an opportunity cost when you consume somebody's time. And we followed the Toronto District School Board rules. If you're going to have a capital expenditure, and this is a small one given their budget size, but we amortize this over 10 years. Um, so this, isn't, this number isn't going to overly burden the analysis. We need to maintain this program. So naloxone has a shelf life of two years. We assumed staff would need to be retrained every three, which is about a standard first aid cycle for recertification. And we assumed you'd have to train a few new staff um, because of staff movement across schools. 
So we're going to cost just shy of $30,000 a year to maintain this program. When somebody has an opioid overdose in a school, they call 911, an ambulance comes, so it's just shy of $1,000 um, in the Toronto area uh, as an estimate of their total budget divided by their call costs or their number of calls. We estimated emergency departments about $500 for the 45% of people that would go to the emergency department and then be discharged. And then for the remainder 55% of people, we assumed they would be inpatient and they will either experience a fatal overdose in hospital or a non-fatal overdose. So we need to now account for the benefits, but compared to the current emergency medical services available. And so at the time, we looked at the Toronto reporting for opioid response, um, and their overall mortality rate is between uh, 5 and 7%. But in some of those cases, naloxone was used by a community member. So we pulled those out and estimate between 5 and 10% fatality for opioid poisonings um, that are responded to by Toronto EMS. And so for this analysis, I'm going to use the 10% number. So how much better are Toronto going to, are, are teachers and staff in a school going to be? Are they going to take that 10% down to like eight and a half? Or are they going to be able to take it further? Are we going to be able to take that 10% down to five? But that's what we're talking about. 90% of people were going to survive anyway, partially because not all overdoses are fatal and partially because EMS was going to respond and provide timely and efficient first response care and get people to medical care in a timely fashion. 90% of people were going to survive anyway, and now how many more people are we going to have survive because of this? But to think about, uh, to use naloxone, you have to have suspected an overdose. And I think this is the real barrier to success in this setting, is that if a teacher walks into a bathroom and sees an unconscious student on the floor, it is unlikely that they are first going to think this might be an opioid overdose. There are many more likely things, including choking um, or an anaphylactic reaction, that would be the more likely causes of this unconsciousness. But in proper health economics, we keep plugging ahead um, because it matters that once we save that life, what's going to happen for the whole rest of it? Um, and so if we look at an average Canadian um, conditional on being 16 years of age, we can look at their lifetime discounted costs, how many lifetime discounted life years, and the discounting on life years is very disappointing as we age, they just keep going down, um, and our quality, lifetime discounted quality adjusted life years. So if you save somebody, how much more healthcare costs are they going to incur in society? How many more life years are they going to get and how many more quality adjusted life years are they going to get? And uh, when we put this in there, reviewers said, wait a second, they just had an overdose. That should have some long time consequences. We said, mm, but we don't know. We don't think that high schoolers who are overdosing have a substance use disorder and have a long term chronic condition. We think that they're probably more like these people who've used it one to five times in the last year. Um, and so that becomes uncertain in our analysis, but every variable we can put in the model and then critically evaluate to whether or not it matters. So we had to model individuals with substance use disorder. So one year mortality after an overdose is about 10% because your risk of a second overdose is very high. We've got a uh, relative risk on our standard mortality rates. We put 25% of people on um, opioid agonist uh, therapy and appropriately reduce their mortality, reduce their costs, and increase their quality of life as a result. And so if a Canadian um, with substance use disorder at age 16, they have lower lifetime healthcare costs, lower life years, and lower quality adjusted life years than if they didn't have a substance use disorder. And we'll consider both of these possible cases, but now we'll consider our base case being that the surviving individual does have a substance use disorder. And so now we've got our total analysis. If we have no school naloxone, we have no program costs. We still have some direct healthcare costs from a potential risk of somebody having an overdose. Um, and uh, and having future healthcare costs associated with that. With this school naloxone program, we incur $37,000 in costs annually, both in setting up the program and then maintaining it. Then we see a reduction in these direct healthcare costs of the ambulance um, and the hospitalizations, mostly due to the reduction in mortality, because that was the highest cost hospitalization. We see an increase in our expected future healthcare costs because we've got more people surviving 
um, higher life years and higher qualities as a result. But then the question is, that's on a per overdose level. So how many overdoses are there going to be across the 112 schools in the Toronto District School Board next year? And currently we've seen none, ever. And so that becomes uncertain. And so we say, well, let's just put no naloxone program here, and then we'll do all the incremental costs and all the incremental effectiveness relative to a world um, with no naloxone program. If we have a naloxone program and there's one overdose in a year, then we're going to see an increase in cost of about 40000 mostly from having the program, and an increase in qualities for having some chance of, of having some incremental life savings as a result. And so our incremental cost effectiveness ratio there would be about 72,000 um, per quality adjusted life year gained. And as far as public health programs go in Canada, that's a very pricey one. Because maybe for some other things, we use numbers like 50 or 100,000. And in public health, the number's just lower. We don't invest in things that are this expensive in public health. And we can argue about whether that's right or wrong, but we don't. Um, if there were two overdoses per year, then our incremental cost effectiveness ratio would be about $39,000 per quality adjusted life year. But if there was only 0.5 per year, so like one every other year going forward, then we would see a pretty high cost, $141,000 per quality adjusted life year. It really matters how many overdoses we expect to see across 112 schools. And so we'll represent our analysis this way. We'll put that incremental cost effectiveness ratio here on the y-axis. And across the x-axis, the expected number of overdoses per year. And we'll just assume that we're better than a police department at first responders. We're closer, and so we have less time delay, perhaps, at reducing mortality, about 27%. We can see here the whole curve, where we've got, at very low rates, very high ICERs. But if, in fact, we were going to see five overdoses across those 100 schools next year, that, in fact, that incremental cost effectiveness ratio would be really low. Um, and well within what we would consider good value for money in health economic terms. But we don't know how effective it's going to be. So we can look at the alternatives. So, and in fact, if we can only reduce mortality by 15%, going from 10% mortality to 8.5, then we're going to find that it's really hard to get under 100,000, and it's almost impossible to get under 50, unless you're going to have three or four overdoses per year across the school district. Oh, we don't see that many overdoses. We've seen none between eight and four on school property in the Toronto area. Um, and we can use threshold analysis to see what would the school based on, or how effective would it need to be to be cost effective at a $50,000 per quality threshold. If you're seeing one every two years, you would need to be able to reduce it by 82%. That would be a pretty high reduction. You're taking it from 90% survival now to 98% survival with the response of teachers and staff in schools. They need to know what they're looking at. They need to find it fast. They need to be able to get naloxone there faster than EMS responds. And they need to think opioid overdose before anything else. Even our first responders have cognitive biases around what looks like an opioid overdose and not, and they go through lots of training to try to lower those cognitive biases so that they'll think overdose in settings where it doesn't look like an overdose. That's going to be more intensive training than we've budgeted for here. Um, and we can consider a higher threshold um, for that analysis. Or we can think about this in another direction. If we don't think we're going to be necessarily any more effective than police in Ohio at a 15% rate, then how frequent does overdose need to be to ensure that it is cost effective at a $50,000 threshold? And we'd need to see about 2.7 overdoses <laughs> per year across 100 schools. So I, I said that the reviewers wanted us to account for the substance use disorder, and we weren't so sure that the people in our model really had substance use disorder or, or weren't instead actually just the victims of high school aged experimentation and contamination as a more likely cause, since the rates of substance use disorder in this population are just so low. So we did a sensitivity analysis on that. So this is the orange line is if the, the um, program were about 27% effective, but with 100% of people having substance use disorder, 
and we drove that number with substance use disorder down to 0%, and that actually just looks like a program that's 46% effective. So there's some, this isn't a major driver of the analysis in the end, but it's not insignificant. Um, and so probably uh, we could have uh, fewer overdoses um, with less effectiveness to uh, make a cost-effective program. Health economics, we always are worried about the uncertainty on our parameters, and so we perform probabilistic analyses. And so if we walk up on this on this x-axis, we've got our willingness to pay threshold, and I've said maybe 50,000 might even be a little bit high in the public health arena per quality gained on that x-axis. And what is the probability that a program is going to be cost-effective holding all of the other uncertainty in the model, or accounting for all the other uncertainty in the model? And we see that if overdose is uncommon, the probability that the program is cost-effective is less than 10%. To get the probability of, of the program being cost effective up over 50%, you need to have one to two overdoses a year. That's a lot of overdoses for um, these schools. And so to answer our question, under what conditions is a school-based naloxone program cost effective, you need more than one overdose per year and a reduction in the opioid poisoning mortality rate of about 40%. That's got to be above current EMS capabilities. And so that's going from a 10% mortality down um, to 6% mortality with this effort, or more than two with a reduction of 20%. And so since the Toronto School Board's about 112, 115 schools, this is about 1% in a single school. So if a school believes that they have a 1% to 2% risk of an overdose in a given year on school property between 8 and 4 when teachers and staff can respond to it, then, uh, then this would look like it was cost effective at a willingness to pay threshold of 50,000 per quality adjusted life year. And the arguments in the newspaper article were, but what if it could save one life? And this is an argument we as health economists hear often, what if it could save one person? And I think that with a limited budget, we have to take it from somewhere else. And that somewhere else might have been able to save two. And that's a regular thing in the healthcare system. When we take money from one place and we put it somewhere else, that there is an opportunity cost that we pay in that somewhere else. And that person may not always be identifiable, but there's always a person who lost that money. And so if we were looking for what could we do in schools that would achieve the same or more quality adjusted life years at a lower cost, then the literature tells us that there are cost-saving things we can do in high schools if we want to do public health. We can do sexually transmitted infection and pregnancy prevention. We can do tobacco use prevention. We can do obesity prevention. We can do eating disorder screening to get people into treatment for eating disorders early. We can do cannabis use prevention. If we wanted to do something about the opioid epidemic, there are things we can do that are more cost-effective than a school-based naloxone program. We can invest in harm reduction. We can expand our supervised consumption sites. We can expand needle exchange. We can use evidence-based opioid use disorder treatments like traditional opioid substitution therapy or new, less traditional methods of injectable hydromorphone, prescription heroin, and oral hydromorphone. We can integrate those services with housing and food stability, mental health and infectious disease care. We can think about emergency response because it's cost effective to put naloxone in the hands of high risk users. We can make sure naloxone is in the hands of all fire departments and police services. So we saw exactly a year later an article in our local paper that said the city of London was thinking about putting naloxone in community centers and arenas throughout the city of London. And the question becomes, this is the same thing. We have a really big problem in London, Ontario, with opioid overdose and homelessness and, and a lack of affordable housing. And we have a, a very high rate um, of people on the street um, and using injection opioids. And this program was not going to cost a lot. This article describes it being a fairly low cost program that they're going to invest $16,000 in putting two naloxone kits in 29 community centers and arenas. It's low cost, but what are the chances that it's going to be used? If we think about the skating rink that you do free skate at, or the community center that you take your kids to do um, free swim at, these are the types of facilities we're talking about.
And so we did the same analysis for the City of London, looking at 29 city facilities to see under low to moderate effectiveness, so 15%, or moderate to high effectiveness, or 27 to 46%, what are the chances that this is going to be good value for money, have a willing, or having an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of less than $50,000? We need to see one to two overdoses a year in these facilities. And the interesting part here is that they weren't planning on training the staff in these facilities. They expected um, people in the general population. They were going to put these naloxone kits with the public use AEDs. And it's research here at the University of Ottawa in the early 2000s that told us that public AEDs are very unlikely to be cost effective in many of the places we put them. And in fact, are only probably cost effective in casinos, not shopping malls, not arenas, not swimming pools, because those are places where it's very unlikely that we're going to need public use AEDs. And when we do need them, bystanders don't know how to use them. And so even though the devices talk you through the entire experience, pulling it out of the wall is an effort that requires training and confidence that you can respond. We're going to see the same thing here. You're at free swim with your kid, and you see somebody unconscious on the floor. Are you going to recognize that this is possibly an opioid emergency? Go over to the public AED station, grab the naloxone kit, and intervene. We have to assume a large number of people are going to be able to do that, recognize that situation and act in that way um, without any training. And I think that that's where we start to get into cases where can it really then result in 15 or 50 percent mortality reductions? Or is it possible that sometimes people will have the training, the skills, and the knowledge to do that, but it's not going to happen frequently enough to result in 15 to 50 percent mortality reductions? Our public health resources are really limited. And we have a lot of problems in public health in my community and I'm sure in yours as well. Cost effectiveness analysis can help us guide how we make resource allocation decisions. We need to think though about the incremental effectiveness. In this case, our first responders are doing a pretty good job. And so with the, if they've got 90 to 95% survivals on opioid overdose calls, and we can increasingly arm uh, our firefighters and our police officers who we can train to make sure that they're less subjected to the cognitive biases um, about who's overdosing and who's not, we can make a high impact there. Those are people who are going to arrive at the scene of overdoses. We can put naloxone in the hands of people who are at high risk for or observing an overdose because they themselves are an opioid user or they are family and friends of opioid users. Putting it in the hands of people who are likely to suspect an opioid and recognize that they're in that situation is going to have the highest impact. And incremental costs. Inexpensive doesn't necessarily imply good value. Spending a small amount of money, $30,000 a year or $16,000 as a city, may seem like a really small drop in the bucket, but our city budgets are really tight. And this might make us feel good, but it's not making our public health situation any better. And any time resources are spent on programs that are not cost effective, they take money away from programs that are. So a year goes by, and February must be opioid month in the newspaper, because I saw this in the New York Times uh, a few weeks ago. So this program in Carter County, Tennessee, is now training elementary school children to use naloxone. That's not to, to treat their classmates. That's potentially to treat their parents and their caregivers. We have a serious opioid epidemic in North America. And we have to deal with it, but we're not going to deal with it by putting naloxone in places that make you and I feel good. We need to put it in places where people are going to be able to use naloxone. There should be no shortage of naloxone at um, places where people who are using and interact with users are going so that they can always replace a used naloxone kit and get another one. We made our spreadsheet model that we did this analysis with public. Um, and so if you would like it, I'll put my email address up at the end to make sure that everybody can access it. You can then change um, the gender distribution, the age, the proportion with chronic substance use disorder, the efficacy of the program and the training um, that you would invest in as your community. And so any school in Ontario or across Canada anywhere in the world, I think, um, could uh, modify our model to evaluate whether or not it's cost effective in their own school. 
And it's possible it's cost effective in your school. Um, and in Canada, we think school-based naloxone is likely cost effective. If there's a greater than 2% risk, your school is going to experience an opioid overdose in the school, eight to four, that staff and faculty can respond to. It's possible, though, that if you know somebody is in that situation in your school, that the right thing to do is not to have naloxone in the office, but to have naloxone in the hands of that individual and their friends and their family members, maybe their teacher. Um, but making sure that naloxone is delivered to the people at highest risk. The opioid crisis is a tragedy requiring action. Um, the, there are more than twice as many deaths right now from the opioid crisis as there are motor vehicle collisions, no matter what the number comes in in this year. I don't know it'll be more than twice um, the motor vehicle collision rate. This also has a really high impact on the individuals who are currently living through this crisis on a day-to-day -day basis. So the work of Gillian Cola at the University of Toronto um, has identified that about 50% of people who use drugs have experienced at least one overdose in the past six months, and almost a third have experienced two. 70% have witnessed more than two overdoses, and 45% have experienced the loss of the friend or a family member in this crisis to overdose. There are people on the front lines of this crisis. They're just not in our high schools. An example of a really good modeling effort for what we should be doing as a society. Um, this work of Alison Pitt and Margaret Brando from uh, Stanford University, they built a large dynamic compartmental model looking at many different interventions that we could be considering um, in the opioid epidemic. And they compared um, what the expected change in opioid deaths would be over a 10-year horizon, given a large number of different interventions that we could be doing as a society. You'll notice that naloxone to people at high risk of overdose is at the top of the list. Medication-assisted treatment, which is, in, is more readily available in Canada than it is in the United States, but expanding medication-assisted treatment decreases opioid mortality over 10 years. The things we've been spending our time doing are the things that increase opioid mortality. Prescription monitoring programs and drug rescheduling, barriers to refill. These are driving people from safe opioids that are pharmaceutical grade, that are of a known potency. They're not putting people into any sort of treatment programs. They're driving people to unsafe and contaminated street supply. And that's why we see an increase in mortality over a 10-year horizon. It's possible that eventually you would get positive health benefits from programs like that. But in the short term, people are switching from prescription supply to street supply, and the street supply is increasingly contaminated. Right now, the fentanyl supply in Ontario is really contaminated with benzodiazepines, and it's really strong. And so as people are going out to buy fentanyl because they don't have access to the prescriptions they've had before, there we're seeing stark increases in the fatal overdose rates just this week. And so these are real problems. We can't just be pulling back prescriptions and filling nothing in behind them. So thank you very much for having me today. And if you're interested in the spreadsheet model, I'm happy to send it to you. Thank you. Are you going to come up? OK. Thank you, Dr. Cipriano, for your presentation on an important topic, um, which highlights the use of cost-effectiveness research. Um, we now have some time for questions. We'll take as many questions as possible, alternating questions in the room and for those online. Um, if you're in the room, please raise your hand, and when I call you, be sure to turn on your microphone so that the online attendees can hear you. If you're online, um, click on the logo at the top of your navigation bar um, on your web interface. A box should open um, and enter your question, your name, your organization, and hit send. And my colleague Bernice will uh, let me know when those come in. Um, so for online or in-person um, questions, please identify yourself and your organization before asking your question. And maybe I'll start um, for now in the room to see if anyone has any questions. Yep, Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah from uh, Cadeth. So I have a question, because that was a fabulous presentation, a wonderful explanation of health economics in action. Have you presented your conclusions and how you got there to any high school, like p parent councils or high school groups? And if so, what has their reaction been? 
So at the time that the paper came out, um, the local media in our area asked the school districts near us, and they had both decided um, not to use naloxone in their schools. Um, but the and then we've since been contacted by some uh, school districts asking for the model, and um, I don't know what the decisions have been in all of those districts. But there's been some uptake of the model to inform decisions, um, and certainly it's not clear that it should even be a uniform decision for an entire school district. It may be some school schools um, and not others. Okay, while we're waiting for some online questions, I'll check again here um, in the room. Oh, Brian? Yeah, Brian from Cadiff. I, I want to build on that question as well because these, these can be very emotional issues, of course, that one death uh, could spark all of the parents to, you know, an uproar to get uh, the naloxone kits into the school so it really is it comes down to a bit of an education uh, on the economics or the value of of these types of programs and not just the naloxone kit you talked about the defibrillator situation and so yeah how do we get that kind of message out to uh, to you know people across Canada about how to uh, how to look at some of these value uh, uh, proposals so I thought the the article that came out after the incident in the um, in the Napanee High School in Kingston was interesting because they had um, three overdoses in fairly close succession, um, and uh, having naloxone in the school it may have been used. Like the article was somewhat ambiguous, but it, it seemed like they had used naloxone in the school or had um, there was sort of a, an acknowledgement of fast response by staff and faculty and emergency response services. Um, but there had been two previous ones acknowledged in the article as well. And there was also a conversation of why didn't you just tell us there were overdoses happening in our community um, because we would have talked to our kids about overdose in advance and, I, and, and the risk of, of drug use. And I think that that's maybe the, the calling card here. Naloxone is after. And, um, and there is, we've seen a, a pretty rapid reduction um, in opioid use over the last decade um, and certainly over the last 20 years for high school age students going from 20% down to 10, even, even trying it. Um, and while well, 50, 100 students using fentanyl is a fairly large absolute number still, that makes like, that sounds like a big number to me. Those numbers are, are quite a bit reduced um, over the past. We know how to talk to students um, about uh, drug use and the harms associated with it. And then among the students who are using, we need to be thinking about why. And, um, and what's going on there, and the high-risk teens that have unstable housing in, in, in our communities. So what are the underlying uh, reasons that different people um, are experiencing drug use and their risk in the first place, and thinking more on the prevention side. And I think that's what uh, the Kitchener High School talked about. They're, they're talking with their, they're investing that same amount of money, they're doing it into prevention. And I think that can be maybe the conversation that's being had, because there's a real risk here. But, um, but we can do this on the prevention side. Okay, we have a question online. So it's from Carolyn Div Davidson. She's a director from Overdose Evaluation and Monitoring at the Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction. So her question is, have you seen the mathematical modeling by Mike Irvin from BC about the deaths averted because of take-home naloxone programs, OPS, SCS, and opioid agonist treatments? Uh, I have, and it's very well done work. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, I think that uh, naloxone take home programs have been demonstrated to be effective and cost effective. Naloxone in the hands of people at high risk of overdose is uh, icers of incremental cost effectiveness ratios of 2,000 per quality adjusted life year for putting naloxone in the hands of individuals at high risk for overdose is exceptional. And so I think that those are the numbers that we need to be thinking about, putting naloxone in the hands of people at risk and in the family members of people at risk um, so that they're going to be identified and used. We want naloxone to be in places where it's going to be used. Yeah, and she has a follow-up point that in BC, they did a mapping where uh, they mapped where pandemics attended overdose, and it lines with your thinking in terms of not needing THN in schools, but supportive housing and shelters instead. Thank you. We had some questions um, here in Ottawa, just checking to still see if they still... Yep, Sam. Hi, I'm Samantha from Cadiff. Um, I wanted to know if there was any um, evidence or uh, any consideration in your model um, in 
putting naloxone in, in places where, where there's a low probability um, of an unconscious person having being due to overdose, so in the schools or, or in, the, in the ice skating rinks or whatever. If there was any evidence of possible harms or increased costs due to people using it for something that is not, in fact, an overdose. So the, the risks associated with naloxone use are really low. Um, naloxone isn't really a drug with a long list of side effects that we need to be concerned about. Um, that that it has are extremely rare. Um, and so just having it, it received naloxone is unlikely to cause harm to people. What it may have caused is a delay in effective treatment. And so especially if you're having to go all the way down to the office and all the way back, if what actually has happened is the person's choking, then, then you have not provided timely, effective first aid in that moment because you did something else. That's always a situation in first aid. Um, those individuals who are responding in those first aid situations are always responding with partial information. Um, but, uh, but certainly, there is a risk when you're putting a technology in and maybe priming people to think about using it that you could delay um, a more effective treatment um, uh, that is more likely. Hi, I'm Matthew Young. Oh, sorry. I'm Matthew Young from the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction. I'm wondering, just based on your work, I, really interesting, um, where might naloxone be cost effective where it currently isn't? Do you have any sense of, like, just based, this is just kind of speculation because you haven't done the work, obviously, but where do you think, like, it's, it's in a lot of community health centers and things like that, but where might it achieve kind of your cost effectiveness where we might not think to put it? So I think that w one of the things that I would be thinking about is um, what would be the prescription pattern that would make me think somebody should also be prescribed naloxone. And so I think right now we're thinking about people who are um, have uh, opioid use uh, and are at high risk of addiction because they're using a lot of um, unregulated street supply that has unknown potency and really unknown composition in general. And so those individuals should be able to access as much naloxone um, as possible and it should be in supervised consumption sites and it should be um, available at pharmacies for people to self-identify that they are the family member of somebody that is at risk and they would like to get it. All of those individuals. But I wonder if there's a composition of prescription patterns that might indicate that somebody is also at risk of a medical accident um, and that there's some composition there where naloxone um, uh, should be co-prescribed essentially with some a uh, certain level of, uh, of opioid um, prescription. And that, that's where I would think, but, uh, but I don't know that it, that would be cost effective. Okay, we have another question online from Nicole Mittman, who's our chief, chief scientist at Cadiff. So her question is, have you thought about how distance or timing for EMS can affect your cost effectiveness results? So particularly in settings such as rural settings where uh, it might take an EMS 30 minutes to get, arrive. Yes. So, um, so all the time in a cost effectiveness analysis, it matters what our effectiveness is compared to our status quo. And so uh, Toronto has um, maybe shorter distances to travel, but high traffic in which to do it. I think that anytime you call EMS, providing as much context as possible um, helps so that they know uh, what speed with which to travel. Um, and but I think that anytime you've got long geographies, uh, then you're going to have higher risk of mortality in the first place, and then it may be more appropriate. I would still wonder if identifying individuals at high risk um, and specific schools at high risk would be better than covering an entire board. And I would also say that I, I know that there's more heterogeneity in fire departments than there are in police departments in terms of whether or not they're carrying naloxone. And volunteer fire departments might be a place where you're going to get faster response. Volunteer fire departments tend to respond quite quickly in their rural communities because they're geographically distributed. Um, and so you may find that uh, rather than putting it in schools, is making sure your first responders are armed and trained to use it, I think um, is more likely to be cost effective than centering it at a school. Checking um, the room here in Ottawa. Brian? Second question. Uh, just going beyond the, um, the opioid issue into public health issues, 
and the use of health economics. It does seem like it's an area that is ripe for more use of HTA in health economics. And particularly now we're seeing with the, uh, the COVID-19 situation and we'll likely see a lot of interventions that are cost effective and many that are probably not cost effective. So just some thoughts on, on the whole use of HTA in health economics and public health. So I do think this is an area that is um, sort of lots of potential for health economists to make important impacts. I think that um, all decision making in a crisis is less likely to be uh, cost effective. Um, in part because you're making it with less information, um, uh, less time to evaluate all the uncertainties, um, and and perhaps more emotion um, in the decisions in which you've got to make them. And so I think that there's a lot that we can learn about uh, epidemic preparedness and the cost effectiveness of different um, health interventions and uh, quarantining interventions, hand washing interventions, communicating those messages to people that are already in the literature that we can learn. Um, there was a lot of modeling effort after um, SARS in Toronto and we can learn a lot from that but there's also a lot um, sort of general knowledge in the epidemic modeling literature about the balance between treatment and prevention, the benefit um, of, of quarantining um, and, and really even in the health behaviors literature about the efficacy of those types of interventions. And I think that building all of that type of stuff into our models so that uh, we can thoroughly evaluate these things and make wise choices, um, often because we already have the plan. We want the plan just to need to come out of the folder, not to have to be created new. Um, and so any time that we can do that work in a preparedness way, I think is going to be result in more cost-effective decision-making. We're about out of time, but we still have two questions um, online, so we'll get through those. Yeah, so another question, it's from someone anonymous, is they want to, they're curious about what is your source for expected change in opioid death, and what do you suggest as an alternative to opioid youth prescribing? Uh, so the opioid death numbers came from uh, the uh, Health Canada website, um, except for my projection for this year, because we only have the first six months of the year reported. So when I calculated that, I looked at um, if I had just doubled last year's first six months, and I saw what the error was in that. And so I just doubled and then inflated in the same way. So that's my source on that. The other, the historical numbers are all just from the Health Canada website. Um, and then what was the second part of the question, Bernie? Sorry. The second part of the question was, what do you suggest as an alternative to opioid deprescribing? Oh, instead of opioid deprescribing. Mm -hmm. So I think that as we think about, um, uh, opioids and the way they've been prescribed for many different reasons in the past. I think that uh, people who have been on long-standing prescriptions uh, need to be working with their practitioners um, and not just having their prescriptions cut um, and, and reduced substantially. And in some cases, that's access to things that we don't cover in public health care. So if what you ultimately would have benefited from at the time of your original injury was physiotherapy, if we don't cover physiotherapy, then, um, but now you're 15 years later and whether you have been consistently taking your pills exactly as prescribed, your body is addicted to opioids. And, um, and just pulling people off of opioids is driving them to a dangerous street supply. And so working with people, I think, um, and working within the context of their lives and the challenges they face. If uh, somebody has a chronic injury that's never had the, uh, the underlying injury addressed, and then um, you start pulling back their opioid prescription, they may have pain, they'll definitely have withdrawal symptoms. And the reason that they're, they're continuing to take is so that they can go to work. And so we have a lot of people functioning on opioid scripts, going to work and living their lives. And by pulling those scripts away, we're driving people to a street supply. We need to be doing better than that because we are creating our own homelessness problem. We're creating our own um, problem with uh, use of the street supply. So I have one more question from online from Carolyn Davison, and her question is, should we include measures of stigma reduction because of naloxone training within your economic evaluations? Um, so should we include a benefit from uh, stigma reduction associated with being trained in naloxone? Um, so 
it is difficult to uh, quantify that in terms of uh, quality adjusted life years, I would say. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like. I've never seen anybody put that into a model before, the benefits of stigma reduction. Usually the benefits of stigma reduction come from the ability of then people to access things. Um, and so if I think about the benefits of reducing stigma in HIV and hepatitis, this has been about reducing stigma and facilitating access to the healthcare system that was otherwise not provided, access to care and uh, compassion that was not otherwise com uh, provided in the healthcare system. Um, and, and, and because there's less stigma about the disease, a more willingness to go get tested. And so when I'm thinking about like what is the benefit of just general stigma reduction, we'd have to be able to see what is that stigma reduction doing um, for, for the health and well-being of people in our society. Certainly stigma is bad, but, um, but it's bad because it causes people uh, harm in these ways that are access to care, access to treatment, or, uh, or a disincentive to find out if you have a condition um, and sort of an avoidance uh, of that condition. And so I think that if we're thinking about how can we um, improve uh, that, it's going to be that the benefits aren't just at that first level of reducing stigma, but also in the healthcare benefits associated with having a society that is open to acknowledging uh, addiction, facilitating access to treatment. Right now we have no access to treatment. A reduction in stigma might benefit people because they can go to treatment. Right now our treatment centers are full um, and have wait lists. And so that's a, we have to think about where are we going to get those benefits and let's make sure that those treatments are available. Okay, um, we'll check um, in the room here in Ottawa one more time. And Bernice, are there any other questions online? No? All right. Okay, um, so a big thank you uh, once again to Dr. Lauren Cipriano for her insights on the opioid crisis from a health economics perspective. And also thank you everyone who joined us today um, for the talk. Uh, we will be streaming a number of live sessions from the CADF Symposium on April 20th and 21st. Um, so watch the CADF website for details. And we will return with new lectures in May, um, so stay tuned. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Cipriano, and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys.